Welcome again to the second day of uh, this uh, small angle neutron scattering course. And uh, today we will start talking a bit more of the practical details of uh, performing a science experiment. So we are going to talk about things that happen and you have to take into consideration when you are planning and performing a small angle neutron scattering experiment. So let's see if I can actually get this to be a laser point. Yes. So the first thing uh, that I'm going to do today is just start with a refreshment of some of the important concepts we saw yesterday. So uh, as, as we explained yesterday, a small angle of scattering arises from uh, uh, from inhomogeneities in the in the scattering length density profile in the mesoscopic scale. Okay, so basically we have this amplitude of the form factor that has these. Uh, a scattering length density distribution. And that's actually what we want to uh, characterize because here's where the structural information is. Uh, so basically what happens is that we go to our experiment and we get some uh, scattering intensity. <clears throat> that is the uh, microscopic scattering cross section. And then from there, we have to reconstruct this uh, scattering length density profile. But what actually happens when we do one of these experiments is that we get some scattering intensities that come from your sample plus some other things. So what we have to do is to apply some corrections to determine this uh, microscopic cross section, which is which will ultimately be the data that we have to analyze. And today we're going to talk a bit more about how we get from this scattering intensity to this microscopic scattering cross section. Okay. So uh, with a small angle scattering, we can measure, uh, we can prove a stru prove a structures between uh, one, a few <clears throat> nanometers to hundreds of nanometers. And it's very important that we are in the in the right Q range because this will determine the, the, the length of scale that we are effectively proving using this, uh, this experiment. And then there are some important uh, aspects about uh, contrast uh, and composition that, uh, that will tell us what we can measure with SANS and, and, and if we can measure that sample with SANS. So for example, if there is any, let's say, uh, natural contrast in the sample, for example, if we are gonna measure something that has some contrast by itself, or if we need to, to do some specific deterioration or isotopic leveling schemes. And then uh, <clears throat> if we can use some of these uh, contrast variation approaches that I explained yesterday to enhance like, the information gain that we can get from this type of system. And then, uh, uh, and finally, some like other considerations, for example, if uh, the use of uh, isotopic substitution will affect the behavior of our system. So that's something that we have to keep in mind when we use one of these uh, contrast variation methods. And the last uh, important thing that I wanted to remind you was uh, the, uh, the scattering vector. So this is one of the most important concepts when it comes to scattering in general, but it's really important when it comes to a small angle neutron scattering. Uh, if you have come across some uh, um, crystallography data, uh, especially X-ray, many times you can see that they plot their intensities against the scattering angle. So this is something not common in science. Uh, because we use the Q vector. And uh, what happens here is that we have some uh, point scatter, some incoming wave vector and a scattered wave at a given scattering angle. Okay, so by playing with, uh, with the Bowlial uh, relationship, we can get that the scattering vector is a, it's a, it's a factor that, uh, that uh, contains information about the scattering angle and the wavelength of the radiation we are using. This means that uh, that the Q vector standardizes uh, the, I mean, this means that uh, regardless of the instrument or configuration that we are going to use, uh, we are going to get the same answer. So for example, let's say that you, we have a feature at 0 0.1, at Q equals 0 0.1 inverse Armstrongs. It doesn't really matter if we are going to measure it in one instrument that is time of flight or in another instrument that has, uh, I don't know, six Armstrong wavelength or four Armstrong wavelength. So it doesn't really matter because they are going to always appear at 0 0.1 inverse Armstrong. And that's because the Q vector kind of uh, it's used to standardize the region of interest of these experiments. And if we go back to Bragg's law and we replace this. Uh, this uh, wavelength and this scattering angle by, by Bragg's law, 
we get that the Q vector is uh, inversely proportional to the real space distance. So this means that uh, if we're gonna gain information about small objects, we have to go to high Q. If we want to gain information about the small features in the system, we have to go to low Q. And that's something that we have to keep in mind also when we do a small angular scattering experiment. So today we're gonna to build up a bit more on some of those concepts and we are gonna talk about how, I mean, what we have to keep in mind when we are planning a small angular scattering experiment and, uh, and what we have to look for when we are one of these experiments. Then uh, we're gonna talk a bit more uh, about how we do the data collection and how we do the data treatment to get to that macroscopic scattering cross section that we want to use for the, which is data we are gonna use for the analysis. And then uh, I will give you just a brief uh, introduction on how the, the, the different access schemes to this uh, type of instruments, uh, the different uh, yeah, routes for accessing this, uh, these instruments. Uh, so I think that Andrew explained you a bit more, a bit more about the instrumentation if in, in small angular scattering. So I'm just gonna go to the important point. So this is the classical schematic representation of a small angular scattering instrument. So basically we have an incident beam. In our case, it's gonna be neutrons because it's the sound scores. We have our uh, wave vector for the incoming beam. We have our sample, and then there is some scattered radiation at a given scattering angle. And then we measure everything and we measure this uh, uh, scattering length, sorry, scattering length, scattered radiation in this uh, 2D detector, okay? So, the first important thing that you have to keep in mind is the Q range that you're gonna measure. The Q range of, uh, we can call this like the figures of merit of a sound instrument. So what happens here is that the Q range is a very important, uh, uh, is a very important uh, parameter because it will determine which uh, length scale we are proving. So we have to know that, uh, that whatever it's outside the, that Q range, we are not, we are not gonna say it. So we have to keep in mind that for the for planning the experiment. Then the, the flux example on sample means uh, the, the amount of neutrons that we are getting uh, in, in, in our sample. So the more, the merrier. So it's important to keep in mind that when we are going to do an experiment, this might be critical to, to, to determine if we are measure five or 50 samples. Uh, instrument resolution, um, this is something that I'm going to introduce a bit more in detail today. And basically, uh, when we are measuring a Q value, what happens is that we have contributions from, uh, from, uh, from uh, Q points around that Q value. So it's not perfectly defined. Uh, and, and this is important because this will kind of uh, tell us how sharp will be the features in our scattering curve. Then the instrument background is basically the noise. And we want to keep that at the bare minimum because the best, the 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 lower it is, the more uh, defined will be our scat small angular scattering data. Then we have the sample environments, and Judith will explain more uh, about this uh, in the next lecture. And basically, we are going to have a series of different sample environments that can perform uh, different uh, different uh, roles in the experiment from just keeping the sample into position to controlling the sample uh, uh, temperature, for example, or to or some very advanced small angle scattering sample environments where you can do uh, complementary methods, for example, spectroscopy. And then another important aspect about the instruments is that if they are available, and uh, this is something that, for example, next year is going to become crucial because uh, because ILL and, and, uh, and NICES are going into a shutdown. So it means that their instruments are not going to be available. So we have to keep this in mind when we are considering uh, which instrument we are going to use. OK, so if we want to 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 consider an instrument for uh, for an experiment, one of the first things that we have to do to consider is the Q range. So how uh, big and small are the things that we can measure in that instrument? And we have here, for example, some of the specifications of, of some of the of some instruments around the world. So we have LOQ uh, and sans 2 d which are uh, time of flight instruments, and we have D11, which is a it's a, a dialer, so it's a continuous source. And we can see here that they have different specifications. So for example, the wavelengths that they use for the experiments, 
and the momentum transfer that they can uh, they can reach with 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 these configurations. Okay. Um, so when it comes to time with uh, we, when it comes to queue range, we have to the first thing that we have to ask ourselves is that are we going to use a time of flight or a continuous source? Normally, what happens is that with a time of flight, we use uh, a set of different wavelengths, and that means that with one detector position, we can reach a relatively wide Q range because we are using different wavelengths. So if you think about the Q vector, we have the scattering angle on top, and then we have the wavelength at the bottom. So it means that at a given scattering angle, we are getting different Q values because, of the, because we are using different wavelengths. Uh, and, and, and normally, we can, in, in one single shot, without moving the detector, this is the configuration that will give us the widest Q range. Whereas continuous source normally uses one uh, uh, continuous source normally uses one specific wavelength. So, for example, here at D11, you have to pick a wavelength between I don't know, but it's probably something between four and and, and, and ten or twelve Armstrongs. And what happens here is that if you want to achieve a wide Q range, you're going to probably have to pick one wavelength and then take different detector positions. Or normally you can also play with the wavelength, but you measure different detector positions or different length, uh, wavelengths to, to achieve the desired Q range. So another is important aspect about the, the Q range is how big is the detector. So the bigger the uh, the bigger is the detector, the, 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 the wider is going to be the, the solid angle that we can reach with that single detector position. So it means that we are going to get more Q, more uh, Q values from that specific shot. And then sample to detector distance. This is something that we can play. For example, in Sun Studio, you can also vary the, the sample to detector distance, but it's not something uh, I mean, you can do that at the beginning of the of the experiment to set up the Q range that you want to measure, but it's not normally something that you change uh, during your experiment at a at a time of flight instrument. Uh, but basically, what that's something that you have to do at, on on continuous sources, for example, on D11 or D22 at ILL, in which you basically take maybe two or three detector positions, sample to detector distances to collect a wide Q range. And some other some other aspects that can uh, uh, affect the Q range is the beam collimation, and then if you want to get to a specific Q regimes, normally what you do is you use some advanced uh, sun geometries, for example, USAPs, if you want to go to really really low angle. And I think that Andrew will explain more about this type of uh, instrument configurations that are not the common, uh, the standard sun setup. When it comes to flux. Uh, uh, basically, what happens here is that the main, uh, the main, I mean, the the, the main uh, contribution to the flux will come from the source. So normally, reactors provide a, a, a higher flux on sample, uh, but then we also have to think that we are going to select one wavelength, so we are chopping away lots of neutrons. So we have to keep in mind which wavelength that we're going to use. So that wavelength is the second factor that we have to take in, into consideration, and then instrument neo, uh, geometry. So these three factors will determine how many neutrons we are going to get in our sample. And this is important because, as I said before, the more neutrons, the faster the measurements will be. OK, so uh, when it comes to uh, the resolution, Basically, what happens is that the intensity that we measure at a given uh, Q value it has contributions from nearby Q vectors. Okay, so there are two different types of contributions. So this is the resolution of the Q vectors, and we have one geometric contribution and one wavelength contribution. Uh, so what, what happens here is that these two different contributions come from different uh, parts. So the geometric contribution comes because uh, our detector elements, so we have normally these, uh, these uh, helium-free tubes, uh, and they have a, fi a finite size. Okay, so it's uh, kind of like five, five millimeter or eight millimeter, it depends on the instrument that you are using. But it means that you're going to have an array of different tubes, and the detector can detect which tube is being hit by a by a by a neutron, okay? But basically, that limits your resolution. It's not that perfect resolution, and that's not Q dependent. You can see that the geometric contribution as uh, oh yeah, sorry, what are we saying? 
yeah, so the, 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 the angle contribution, the geometric contribution is not Q dependent, so it's wavelet dependent, but not Q dependent. Uh, and then the other, the other contribution comes from the wavelength that you are picking and the, con the, the configuration of the instrument. So what happens here is that we have different, uh, um, different uh, types of, let's say, velocity selectors, which basically will uh, decide which wavelength we are going to use for our experiment. And those will give a defined, uh, uh, a defined uh, wavelength for the neutrons. And I will show you in the next slide how that works more or less. Uh, so basically this will give us some wavelength resolution. And as you can see here, uh, this is Q dependent. So we have at the end that this uh, Q dependent resolution, uh, if we add these two contributions, we have uh, a resolution that depends uh, on the Q. So normal on the Q vector. So normally when you go to do an experiment, they calculate the resolution for you that then you can use to, 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 to uh, smear your uh, theoretical models, okay? So just keep in mind that depending on which type of instrument configuration you use, you're gonna have two different types of contributions to your resolution. One is the wavelength contribution that comes from how you select your wavelength for the experiment. And the other one is your detector. Okay, so for example, helium free tubes have different spatial resolutions, but a, a CCD camera will have a much better resolution, but it has also some other disadvantages. So, uh, so basically uh, what happens is that when you have a, 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 this like a resolution affecting your data, what is gonna happen is that it's gonna smear some of the features in your, uh, in your data. And I will give you, show you some examples later about it. And uh, I thought I had a picture here, but apparently I don't, maybe it comes later. So basically what happens here is that we, it's gonna smear some of the features in your scattering signal. And it's actually very difficult to, let's say they convolute the resolution from your data. So a common approach is actually to smear the, theoretical models that we use for the analysis of the data. I'm going to talk about this tomorrow more in detail, how we smear these theoretical models. But what happens here is that then we are going to have a function that accounts for this resolution, the resolution that we get from the instrument configuration. Because as I said, these values will be calculated for each Q vector and then will be will appear in our data and we will use that to smear our theoretical models. And then it's important to know that uh, there is always a compromise between flux and resolution. So the higher is the resolution, normally the lower is the flux. And sometimes to improve like our resolution by uh, maybe, I mean, if we want to go from a 10% resolution to a 5% resolution, maybe we have uh, two, of, uh, two orders of magnitude of, uh, the, our flux is two, of our, two, of, two orders of magnitude lower. So we have to actually really decide if resolution is that important for us. Okay, another aspect about uh, science experiments is the, the background that we have uh, in, our, uh, in our measurements. So it's kind of like the, mini, the, the bare minimum signal that we can measure in our system. So we have a scattering that is weaker than our background. Basically, we're not gonna be able to see it because it's gonna be completely dominated by the background. So we have to keep in mind that the lower is the background, the better. So the background normally comes from uh, uh, from different contributions. So one is the stray radiation, so neutrons coming from others, uh, from other instruments and, and then from the space and things like that, and electronic noise from the detector and things like that. So are things that actually we cannot control. We can try to minimize it uh, by, for example, placing some uh, shielding and uh, by playing with instrument geometry, for example, using like curve guides in, in time of flight instruments and improving the detector electronics. But the thing is that uh, we cannot just easily uh, change the background in, in, in an instrument. It's not that we can go there and just play some more shielding. And uh, uh, I mean, during an experiment and that will improve our background. So actually what normally happens is that when they have uh, internal time, they just basically, uh, put all of the shutters down and they just measure the signal that comes from the environment and that's the background and then they're gonna we're gonna subtract that to our to our uh, to our uh, 
to the to the experimental data we get. Okay, so this is something that we cannot easily play with, but it's something that we can subtract. And then there is also uh, some background scattering that comes from the sample. It's the incoherent scattering that we mentioned yesterday. For example, the presence of hydrogen will uh, of proteome will increase the, the the incoherent background, and this is something that we also need to account for and subtract. But this is a different type of background. Okay, so just to give you a couple of minutes of uh, of, uh, of fresh air, I'm just going to show you some pictures of different instruments. So this is Sun Study Arises. This is the detector chamber, and this is the 22 uh, at ILL, and this is the detector chamber. And the first thing that you can probably see is that the detector chambers of Sun Study is much shorter than that of the 22. And that's because one is a time of flight instrument. And as I explained before, we can measure a wide Q range just by using one <clears throat> detector position. Whereas at D22, we have to move the detector to reach like a wide Q range. So you can go, I think, down to 20 meter and, uh, and, and, and sample to detector distance. And I think that in D11, you can go down to 40 meter to get to the lowest Q value, okay? But just keep in mind that the different uh, time of flight and uh, continuous source sounds instruments will, uh, will, will, will be different in terms of, uh, of, of building. And this is just the sample area of uh, D22. There is in some kind of like dialysis unit here. And this is Rob playing with the, with the sample changer and Larmor. And, and as you can see, like this instrument, it's a, it's a bit more complex because they can also do like stuff with magnets and, and things that I can barely understand. Okay, so what do you have to do when you do your experiment is you have to pick the Q vector that you're gonna measure, that's very important. And this will determine the wavelength that you're gonna use and the detector type and position that you're gonna use for this experiment. And then there are some more complex configurations, basically using the, upper, the, 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 the collimation and the size of the apertures at the sample position and so on. And uh, also the sample environment will determine which configuration you can use, but it's, it's something that Judith will mention later, I guess. But basically here, what happens is that by playing with the different, uh, different uh, characteristics of the instrument, like wavelength, detector position, aperture, and collimation, you will get uh, different Q ranges. So basically, you will have to pick what you want to what you want to what you want to get in terms of Q vector. So another aspect that will be influenced by that will be the resolution of your measurement. So this is the classic pinhole collimation, and then we start to open the aperture. And basically, what happens is that we change the profile of our uh, beam in terms of wavelength. Okay, so this is something that will affect our resolution it will increase the flux, but it will affect our resolution, uh, as I mentioned before. And, uh, and, and, and basically by playing with these, uh, with these uh, different aspects of the instrument, this will determine the Q range, the flux and the instrument resolution. And I said before that I was missing a picture and this is the one that I was missing. Just to show you how, uh, for example, a velocity selector selects, uh, a given wavelength with a given resolution and how that will influence the flux. Okay, so this is the neutron flux at NCNR. And what happens here is that the total number of neutrons per unit area and time we are getting is the integration beneath this curve. Okay, so if we want to select an area of the neutron, I mean, if we want to select uh, a neutron wavelength, we can, let's say, open or close. Uh, I mean, the, the let's say that the, the velocity selector will uh, select a wider or a narrower uh, wave band. So what happens here is that if we, for example, want to have a better resolution, this velocity selector will, <clears throat> will select a narrower uh, a narrower uh, wavelength uh, wave band. But this will also mean that the, integ the, that the integral beneath the curve will be smaller, which means that we're gonna have a much lower flux. Whereas if we peak, if we are less picky with the resolution and we have like a wider uh, wave band, we are gonna have 
more neutrons. Okay, so this is basically how we can just like in a simple way understand how the the, the selection of the resolution will uh, of the wavelength resolution in this case will determine how many neutrons we are getting. Okay, because of the integral means this uh, this curves. Okay. So how this affects the data that we are actually collecting. So I have here some really simple and probably not the best examples, but some really simple uh, plots where I'm showing the scattering from the spheres. And now I'm gonna uh, just like get you to think about uh, Q range for spheres, okay? So basically, let's say that we have these uh, 20 amps from spheres. We measure this entire Q range for the green curve. Basically, we see uh, the different parts of the curve. So we see the skinnier region around here, and then we see the oscillations at high Q in the pearl region. And this means that we are collecting the entire data set. So we are collecting the Q range that we require to resolve the structure of the system. But then when, if, if instead of picking the instrument configuration that give us that Q range, we pick another one that doesn't go to high Q, what happens here is that we get information on the size of the particles because we get the Q range, but the interfacial scattering that comes from the high Q expansion of the data has disappeared because we haven't actually proved it using that instrument configuration. So we don't have this region here and there will be things like polydispersity or anisotropy and things like that that will be difficult to prove using this configuration. So we have to be aware of what we are actually proving. And then, in the, in, the, in the next example, so we have some slightly bigger sphere. So this is 80 Armstrong. I think I could have picked a better example that is more, even more exaggerated. But here what happens is that we are not, uh, the, the, the cumin that we are proving with this instrument configuration is getting close to this linear region. So we are actually not getting this plateau that the data reaches a low Q. And what happens is that uh, if we if we get this to the extreme, there is going to be a point in which we are just going to see maybe just this part of the data, because we are not going to have Q values that are low enough to prove the entire size of the scatter. So we are going to be missing that bit of information. And this is a problem when we have something that is like really big, like probably hundreds of Armstrongs and so on, or even more. Um, and I think that we'll have a few examples tomorrow about this. Uh, Another important aspect is the resolution, as I said, and I want to show you how the resolution affects the data. So what happens here is that I have exactly the same uh, model being simulated. And what is happening here is that I'm applying, I'm applying different resolution, uh, uh, resolution uh, values to this data. So M1 has a, has a perfect resolution. So we have like one single wavelength, uh, we have like an infinitely good uh, geometric resolution. So basically we are doing like SACS with a SANS instrument because in SACS we have super good resolution. So as we can see at low Q, we have basically no effect in this uh, configuration for the different resolutions, but we can see how these sharp features are getting worse and worse when we are uh, uh, moving up in resolution. So 0% is the king one, and then we go to 5%. So this, these are less defined, and then we go to 10%. And we start to see that the peaks here, high Q start to disappear. And when we are at 20%, which is not that uncommon, basically all of the features are gone. Okay, so all of these features are gone. So this is not, uh, if, for example, your system is, is polydispersed, it's not really important, so it's not the end of the world. But if you are looking at something that is crystalline or if you are looking at something that you really want to have uh, good information on, for example, is, uh, small deviations from, from isotropy, then you really want to have like a good information here, good resolution at high Q. And, and, and to achieve that, you have to select wisely uh, the instrument configuration, okay? I would say that a normal uh, SANS configuration uses uh, about a 10% resolution, uh, depending on the Q value that you are using, of course, but uh, normally the resolution at low Q is low and at high Q we have better resolution uh, with the configurations that we normally use. So we can get to, to pretty good uh, resolution at high Q. Um, so, Basically, what happens is that by playing with the different uh, configurations that I mentioned before, 
we will determine the cure range, the flux and the sample and the instrument resolution. But I know that there are many things to keep in mind and it's not always easy to just, they are not all of, not always straightforward. So my recommendation uh, when you are gonna pick some instrument configuration and I think that this is more or less what people uses and thinks about it is that first, uh, you should uh, simulate the data or try to kind of like just pick a sun software, uh, a small angle scattering data analysis software and just say, okay, I think I'm gonna have some spheres of this size because this is something that I've seen in DLS or with NMR. So do some characterization first and then basically just like try to get some information on the Q range that you need to prove that structure. Then basically you have to also think about the resolution that you will need. For example, do you have any peaks in the system? Is your system very monodispersed? Is very isotropic? Uh, because if it is, probably you will need a good resolution to, to look at those specific uh, features. So then that will basically, if it is important, if resolution is very important for you, you will have to tell the VLAN scientists like, yeah, I need this resolution, 5% resolution, 10% resolution, and he will basically tell you what is the best instrument configuration that will give us will give you the highest flux, which is what you want. But there will always be a compromise. So if you want a higher resolution, it's gonna mean it means that you are gonna have a lower flux. If you want to go to really low Q, it means that your uh, your your uh, exposure time will be longer. Okay, so this is something that you have to keep in mind. So moving to the next part, I'm going to talk a bit now about uh, the different uh, calibrations that are performed uh, in the small angle neutron scattering instruments. So this is something that the beamline scientists will normally do for you, but it's something that you can keep in mind uh, so you know what is actually happening. So in a perfect small angle neutron scattering, you have a constant flux that you know, you have a known neutron spectrum and it's perfectly defined and you have no background, but actually this doesn't exist. So this means that to, to, to get the data that you wanna get, you will have to apply some corrections to the raw data that you obtain in a small angle neutron scattering experiment. And then you have to do some calibration measurements for this. So you have to measure the wavelength and wavelength spectrum, the incident flux, the efficiency of your detector and the dead time. Um, so I'm just gonna go very briefly through this because uh, as I said, this is something that is performed uh, by the small and by the by the beamline scientist, and it's not that you need to know all of this for your experiment, but it's good to actually be aware of what is actually happening. So one of the first things that are performed is that you have to calibrate your wavelength. So you have to determine the neutron wavelength that is getting to your instrument. Uh, so to do so, you have two options. One is to use a standard that has normally a peak, and it has a, so it has like a known scattering so we know how this is going to scatter so this is a, for example silver vna and it has a peak around it has a d spacing uh of uh, 58.38 armstrong so if we use bracket law we can see that there is going to be a peak appearing at 0 0.01 uh inverse armstrong so basically we measure the scattering from that and we know that this peak will have to be at that given q value Okay, and if there is deviations from that, it means that our wavelength is not correct. Okay, so we have to correct the, the wavelength that we are. Uh, so this will be used to kind of like know the wavelength that we are using for that experiment. And then another way to do this is to use the time of flight, uh, a time of flight configuration, let's say. So what happens here is that we have two small detectors that are called pencil detectors. Uh, before the sample position. So what happens is that the instrument hits this pencil detector. So we know, so there is like a chopper stopping neutrons. So the chopper lets some neutrons in, they hit this first detector and then the neutrons travel and they hit the sun's detector. So basically there is a time uh, that the neutrons take to go from here to here. And we can actually use that to calculate the velocity of the neutrons. And by using the Vogel relationship, we can calculate the wavelength of the neutrons. So those are two typical ways to calculate, uh, to calibrate the wavelength in, uh, in some instruments. But this is something that is normally performed uh, uh, before you go to, to do the experiment. Okay, so uh, the incident flux is measured in, I only mentioned one, but there is another way to measure it. So, 
The incident flux uh, is measured using the direct beam. So basically you have a direct beam hitting your uh, detector. Normally it's attenua attenuated, so you don't burn your detector, but you have your uh, beam hitting your detector and it's gonna tell you how many neutrons that detector is, is uh, how many neutrons are reaching the detector. And basically that's gonna give you your flux. Another way of doing this is by using a standard sample. So for example, a polymer. And then we know that uh, that should show an I of zero. So uh, so the intensity at angle zero should be, I don't know, a given value, it's a standard. And then we can use that value to calibrate uh, the, the incident flux. And that's normally, that is, and that's something that is normally performed at uh, time of flight uh, instruments instead of this direct beam. Uh, so the other uh, calibration that you that it's performed is the detector efficiency. So you have to think that uh, these detectors have an array of tubes and not all of them are uh, perfectly equal. So there's going to be, uh, uh, let's say, there's going to be an efficiency associated to each of these pixels. So what you have to do to measure this, uh, to correct for this, is that you have to pick something that is an incoherent scatterer because as Andrew said yesterday, incoherent scattering is a four, has a four pi dependence, which means that it's just gonna go everywhere. It's not, it doesn't have any uh, angle dependence. So what happens here is that there is gonna be some uniform signal hitting the detector. Uh, if we use, for example, H2 or plexiglass, and then we use that to calculate the def deficiency of each of the pixels and correct for that. So uh, the dead time is basically uh, the, the the time required for uh, the detection of new, of a neutron uh, uh, to to detect a, a neutron here in the, the the detector, and this uh, relates to when the detector is saturated. So if we are sending too many neutrons and too fast to our detector, we just might get to the situation where we saturate the detector and you know, it's not capable of measuring them. Uh, it's not capable of measuring them. So basically what happens here is that they have to do some, uh, some, some calibrations to measure what is this uh, dead time, which means that if we go above this dead time, the detector will not be able to cope with the neutrons and we're gonna have to use a lower flux or a weaker scatter in this case. And basically, yeah, this is something that it's also performed at, uh, before you go to the to the to the facility. So uh, once you've done some of these uh, measurements, what you have to do is that you will have to correct the data that you get because basically the scattering intensity you have will have different contributions. So we'll have some contribution from the instrument configuration because it has optics, it has uh, different things on the beam path and that's gonna affect your scattering as you can see in this schematic representation. So it gets to this aperture and suddenly it just hits this corner of the aperture. So there is gonna be some scattering coming from that. So there is con some contribution from the, from the instrument there is going to be some contribution from the sample, which is what we actually want to measure, these orange lines here. Then we have some contribution from the cell, because basically the cell is also in the beam path. And even if we normally use sample environments that have very, very, very little uh, interaction with the neutrons, there is always some interaction. So what happens here is that when it hits the cell, it just like gets scattered and goes somewhere. And then we have some background that it's basically coming from somewhere else uh, outside the instrument, some electronic noise and stray neutrons from other instruments or out of space. So what happens here is that we have to, uh, to correct uh, for these different things. I just like put here some of the, uh, yeah, what, what each of these uh, uh, symbols and letters means. So we, I'm not gonna go into detail, but so you know, for example, we have neutron flux, detector efficiency, the soil angle of the, of the detector and so on. So there are some things that, as I said before, we have to determine before uh, getting what we want to get, which is the macroscopic cross section of the sample. Okay, so we have here our sample, and we have this microscopic cross section, which is the data that we actually want to analyze. But this is what we are actually measuring. So we have to correct for all of this, okay? So there is some like, let's say standardized protocols to do this. And, uh, and as I said, the beamline scientist is aware of this. It's not that you know you need to know all of this by heart, but it, I think it's good that you have an idea of what is actually happening there. 
So basically to get the scattering, the microscopic cross section of your sample, what you have to do is that you have to measure the scattering from the sample, the scattering, uh, so the sample in your cell and you put it there in your sample environment, then you measure the, sta the scattering from, the, from an empty sample holder, you measure the block position. So basically you, you cut all of the incoming neutrons and this means that you can, for example, determine the background signal. Uh, you measure the direct beam intensity to get the total flux. You measure the, trans the transmission, uh, which is uh, the transmission is the neutrons that pass through the sample without being scattered. Uh, you measure the transmission. You measure the an empty uh, the transmission of the of the empty beam. Uh, and then you measure the detector response and efficiency. Uh, and finally, you can also measure the solvent scattering to subtract that. So basically with these first seven, you're gonna perform the corrections that will allow you to go from the intensity that you actually measure to the microscopic cross section of your sample, okay? And then there is one step more, which is a step number eight which is the, the scattering signal that comes from the solvent or from your matrix. So what happens here is that once you apply all of those corrections that I mentioned before, you get what it's called the reduced file. So you go from your raw data to your reduced file. So your reduced file is basically going to have the scattering from the sample plus the solvent. Okay, so basically it's, sorry, it's the, it's the scattering from your particles plus the solvent. It's, it's like here represented as the as this black uh, curve. So what happens is that to actually get the microscopic cross section from your particles, you have to subtract this solvent contribution or this matrix contribution. So what you have to do is that you perform a measurement where you measure this uh, signal from the solvent and then you subtract that contribution to get your scattering signal, which in this case is the blue. Okay, so this is actually uh, quite important to do it right, because normally uh, this is actually log of the data of intensity. You overstruct these values. Uh, what will happen is that you will have some negative, incentive, uh, negative uh, intensity values, which means that if you, are, if you present them in a log-log scale, they are just gonna disappear because you cannot calculate logarithm of a negative uh, value. So what happens here is that you have to be aware that you are not over subtracting or under, uh, under subtracting uh, the, this solvent signal. And the way to do that is to, you go to the high Q expansion of your data, you see what is the intensity of your sample and the intensity of your solvent. And because of this high Q data mainly coming from the contribution of the solvent, because it's what it's most important there, uh, Basically, you can just like scale your solvent up and down until you get the desired scattering signal. Uh, so I think that this is my last bit. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about how you can access uh, this type of instruments. And um, I, I, think, I think that probably some of you are already aware of this, but I think it's important to know that at different scattering facilities, they have different access routes. Uh, so this is, for example, from ISIS, and they have this nice diagram that will tell you what is the best way for you to, to access this, uh, this uh, uh, to access the, the instrument and to get some beam time, okay? So for example, if you need some quick measurement and, uh, and if, if it is something relatively straightforward that doesn't require complicated sample environments, then you can apply for a SPREX access. access. So a SPREX uh, access basically it's just a mail-in system that you send your samples, a few of them, and they will measure them for you to actually just maybe know if, if, if SANS is a good technique for the characterization of your sample or, or, or something else, or like complete a data set or something like that. If you want to do use a more complex, uh, if you want to have a more complex experiment, for example, having a, an advanced sample environment, or you want to measure lots of samples, you will have to apply for a full proposal. And there are two different ways of doing this. One is the normal access. So we have the direct access, uh, which basically is, let's say, the standard access for, 
for these uh, facilities. And then we have that I'm going to explain in a minute. And then we have rapid access. So rapid access is when you have something that is very urgent. So it's something that is either a very hot topic and you want to get it out as soon as possible. Or for example, you are a PhD student that you are about to finish and you need to do some measurements. Okay, so so you can try to bribe the, the, the mainline scientists and uh, by saying like, oh yeah, I need to, to do this. And uh, so I need some uh, beam line, some beam, some access to the beam line uh, really, really fast. And, and this is uh, some of the routes. So basically these are very fast. They will allow you to perform either a few measurements or an entire experiment. And this normally takes a bit longer, okay? So basically what happens here is that for the standard access route, uh, which is what, I, what ICE is called the direct route, Basically, you get a full experiment, and your proposal will be reviewed by an ex by some external scientific panel. There is normally two calls per year, and you have to wait for a bit before you go to do your experiment. So you have to plan this ahead. So discretionary access is the direct access. So what happens here is that you get a full experiment, and it has to be either a hot topic or that you you are a PhD student, you are about to finish, and so on, and you want to convince them that it's very important for you to get your experiment as soon as possible. So this is a rolling proposal mode that basically means that you can submit this proposal at any time, and you can uh, typically get your BIM done in one month because they always save some uh, experimental time for this type of proposals, but it's also very, very scarce. So it's difficult to actually get this type of, of access. But uh, if you are in, a, in, in an urgent need, you can always do that. So express time or test access or EC, it has different names at, at different facilities. What happens here is that you want to just, just check some samples. For example, I'm sending some samples today to ILO for, for some EC experiment. It's called like that, uh, the, the type of access. So what happens here is that they are gonna measure some of the samples for me to get some data and to, to submit like a full proposal for the next round. So you can use it for collecting some preliminary data. It's also a rolling proposal that you can submit at any time. And normally in a few weeks, you can uh, you get your experiment done if it is something relatively straightforward. And then uh, something that is not included uh, in, the, in the previous, uh, in the previous slide, but it's something that, uh, and it's not that common, but basically you can also pay for having access to these instruments. Uh, you can get like full experiments and it's very expensive, I can tell you that. And it's normally used by industry because they want to either keep all of the proprietary knowledge for them or uh, because they want to just have the beam time available for when they want to do the experiment. And basically, yeah, they just pay for the beam time and they just get access to those instruments. So, yeah, so what happens here is that depending on uh, what the type of uh, proposal that you're gonna submit, is gonna go through a different uh, process. So the first thing that you have to consider is how to write your proposal, okay? So I'm going here to one proposal that I submitted to NCNR uh, a few years ago, and basically it had more or less this structure. So basically, I have a standardized way of uh, writing proposals and uh, that works for me. Uh, not, I guess that not everyone does it in the same way, uh, but basically what I do is I use some like scientific background to explain why, why, what, why the science that I'm performing is relevant. Uh, it's important to put some references because it looks like you know what you're doing. Uh, then it's also very important to include some preliminary data because you have to show them that SANS or, uh, or any other technique, but now we are talking about SANS, will be useful for the characterization that you want to perform on that sample. So you have to put some structural characterization normally or some uh, data that relates to a structural feature. So you can present some NMR or the spectroscopy too, but normally some structural characterization is, is always good, DLS or SACS, for example. So you present that data and then the important thing, and this is very crucial for almost any sense uh, characterization, is that you have to explain them why SANS is needed. Because otherwise they will tell you, oh, use, use X-rays, they are available in labs, you can access um, easily, you can access them easily at a synchrotron facility. So they will tell you do SACS, but you have to explain why you need to do 
small angle neutron scattering for resolving the questions that you are trying to 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 answer. Uh, so basically, it's important to tell them uh, why science and also why you selected that instrument in particular. Then basically, you have to present your experiment plan. So what you're going to measure, how many samples, how many contrasts, the configuration that you want, the sample environment, and for how long are you going to be measuring? So for example, here, I think that we requested three days. And then you can also put like a brief statement on what are you going to do with the results? Uh, so are you going to, how you're going to analyze the data? If there is going to be, uh, if you're going to involve some other techniques, for example, SACS or NMR, uh, if this is planned to be like published in uh, some journals or whatever, if it is part of a PhD project. So this is something important too, actually, because they want uh, the community to keep growing. And the way to do that is by, uh, by educating and forming new uh, scientists on the techniques. So it's important that they know if this is part of a pre project or, or, a, or a master project or something like that. So what happens when you submit your proposal is that you have your research problem. So you have to ask your question, can a small angle neutron scattering help me with this? So you write your proposal if you think that the answer is yes. You have to say what is the relevance of the science that you are performing, what you want to achieve with the experiment, and what is your plan. So you have to submit it. If it is the standard proposal round, you have to submit it before the deadline, because otherwise you will have to wait half a year for the next call. And then they're going to gather some scientific panels that will evaluate the quality of your proposal. And then they will accept it or deny it. We have to keep in mind that this is a competitive scheme. You're going to be competing. They have a limited amount of resources that they can allocate. So you're going to be competing against other scientists. So for example, next year that these two facilities are going into a shutdown, ILA and ISIS, there is going to be, uh, there is not going to be much uh, beam time available for small angle neutron scattering in Europe, which means that it's gonna the competition will be brutal, and, uh, and and the likelihood of getting your proposal accepted will be lower. Which doesn't mean that your experiment is not interesting or the science that you are performing is not interesting. It's just that it was not the time. Okay, so you have to keep that in mind, and uh, and uh, and they will in case that it gets uh, rejected. Uh, they will give you some feedback on how to improve it and what how they think that, that the the proposal could be a bit better for uh, for the next round and so on. So it's always good to 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 also listen to that feedback. And if you get your proposal accepted, what is going to happen is that a few months later, the beam line scientist is going to send you an email saying, "Okay, I have to put your experiment. Uh, we have to schedule your experiment at some point." Uh, what do you think about this when you're available? So you give them some dates uh, for this experiment and they are going to tell you, okay, come come, uh, come here whenever you, I mean, for, for these dates and we will do the experiment. So you will have to plan the experiment for those dates and you will have to keep things uh, in mind. Like for example, if you have to travel, because now in COVID times it's a bit more uh, complicated and many experiments are being performed remotely. Uh, you're going to have to get the chemicals for the experiment, especially if they are deuterated. This is something that you have to keep in mind and you might need to plan ahead. For example, do I need to contact a uh, deuteration facility to, to, to get all of these uh, chemicals or do I need to buy them? But just what I said yesterday, just think that not everyone has deuterated cotton candy in the lab. Uh, then you have to come out with an experiment plan and what you're going to do at the experiment that you have to have this very clear because you're going to have to work a lot. You're going to have to do night shifts. So it's better to have a plan and not just go cowboy style and hope to get there and decide everything last minute. And then just like sort out the logistics. For example, if you have to travel, you have to book your flights and so on. So these are some important aspects that we have to keep in mind. Okay. So in summary, uh what it's important when it comes to performing an experiment is that you have to come up with a plan and you have to really decide if you need neutrons for uh for answering the question and you need to actually figure out how you're going to access those neutrons uh to perform that experiment so basically then you will have to pick an instrument and uh, you will have to decide what uh, configuration of the instrument uh, you're going to use 
and uh, how that will enable you to access the, the information that you want to get. Then you will have to, to go to the facility or if it is a remote experiment, you will have to send your samples to perform the experiment. You will have to reduce the data. And then that basically means that you have your macroscopic scattering cross section, which is the signal that you will have to analyze and then probably spend at the very least a few weeks analyzing the data and, uh, and having fun with that. And uh, tomorrow we are gonna talk a bit more about data analysis. Uh, which is the next part of my series of lectures. And this is all I had to say about uh, experimental small angle neutron scattering. So if you have any questions, you can either ask them now or we can leave them for the future. I think I put my email. question. Yes. Uh, is there any uh, protocol concerning the handling of uh, uh, measured samples? because many of these materials can potentially become radioactive once it, is, it has been exposed to neutron beams. Yes, uh, so it depends on what material you are working and when you submit your experimental risk assessment before the experiment, you basically have to state the compounds that you are gonna measure. So for example, if you have uh, like, uh, you have uh, some neutron absorbers and things like that, they will, be, they will get hot and they will be uh, radioactive. So what you have mm. to do, is that after the experiment, they're gonna, so they're gonna give you a protocol on how to deal with those samples. So the standard protocol is that all of the samples that have been in the beam will be tested for uh, different types of radiation. But then if you have something that is marked with like a, yeah, with like especially radioactive or activated material, then they will have also established protocol. And uh, sometimes you have to leave your samples there for like weeks or months until they get deactivated or, or if they don't get deactivated, they will dispose them for you as radioactive material. But that means that you cannot take your sample back. Mm -hmm. So it, it's sample dependent and that's something that they, they have like an established protocol for that when they receive their, the, the experimental risk assessment. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm not sure if there is another question here in the chat. <laughs>